Chapter 4 Evolution There's no scientific theory that's both so well known and so disputed as the theory of evolution. Perhaps I should say theories of evolution because even among respected scientists, there's significant disagreement over just how evolution works. Outside of science, of course, we find even more disagreement. The reason, I believe, is a cloudy understanding of just what's involved in evolution. In the broadest sense, evolution simply means that things change over time. As things change, the things that are good at sticking around and replicating themselves do so, while the other things don't. The things that are good at sticking around and self-replicating are called replicators. The two most interesting replicators in the universe today are the gene, which is the basic replicator in the universe of biology, and the meme, which is the basic replicator in the universe of the mind. When we use the word evolution, as in the evolution of species by natural selection, we're making a distinction between the winners of that battle, which continue to exist, and the losers, which don't. Natural selection means that the forces of nature are doing the selecting, as opposed to the artificial selection of breeding pedigreed dogs, for example, in which people do the selecting. The things that are not good at sticking around eventually disappear through entropy, the tendency of things to randomize and level out over time, like sandcastles on a beach or a decaying log. Evolution is a scientific model of how things become more complex. Entropy describes how things become simpler. They are the creative and the destructive forces of the universe. The two forces operate not only in the physical universe, but also in the realm of the mind. The study of evolution is the study of making copies. A replicator is anything that gets copied. Sometimes a replicator seems to do more than just get copied passively. It seems to take a more active role. Perhaps it could be said to make copies of itself. The difference is merely a matter of point of view. Sometimes it will seem more natural to think of a replicator as making copies of itself, as when cells split and DNA duplicates. At other times, it will make more sense to think of a replicator as something that just happens to get copied, as when people hum a catchy tune or the idea of democracy spreads throughout the world. In all cases, the copying happens, which is what evolution needs. Anything at all that gets copied, no matter what the copying mechanism and whether or not there is a conscious intention to copy, is a replicator. Sometimes mistakes get made in copying. That's necessary for evolution to take place. If the fidelity of the copies is too high, nothing ever changes. If it's too low, you don't really have a replicator. Soon the quality that made the thing good at replicating will be lost, just as a copy of a copy of a copy of an office memorandum becomes illegible. Evolution requires two things. Replication with a certain degree of fidelity and innovation or a certain degree of infidelity. Of course, if only one or two copies ever get made of a replicator, it's not a particularly interesting one for the purpose of understanding evolution. We're interested in replicators that produce enough high-fidelity copies of themselves that those copies in turn become replicators and the resultant exponential growth quickly produces a large number of copies. When we talk about survival of the fittest, we mean survival of the thing that's best at replicating. In evolution, fitness means the likelihood of being copied. The fitter something is, the greater its chances of being copied. The word fit in our model of how evolution works means nothing more than that. There is no connotation of strength, agility, longevity, or extraordinary intelligence. If a replicator is fit, it's good at replicating. That's all. It's tempting to think that a durable, long-lived replicator might compete successfully against a shorter-lived one that's better at being copied, but mathematics shows that this is not the case. The fittest replicators make the most copies of themselves and therefore become more abundant than the rest. Survival of the fittest is just a bit misleading. It's more like abundance of the fittest. Of course, if resources are scarce, the gain of the fittest replicators is at the expense of those less fit. All this brings us to Dawkins's selfish gene. The selfish gene theory in one flash of insight answered so many sticky questions and puzzling details of evolution that it paralleled the astronomical discovery that the Earth was not the center of the universe.
While Dawkins popularized the selfish gene theory in the same 1976 book in which he introduced the word meme, credit for the first publication of the idea goes to British biologist William D. Hamilton in 1963. Prior to Hamilton's work, most scientists had assumed evolution revolved around us, or individuals, of whatever species we're discussing. The Darwinian idea was that evolution proceeded by the fittest individuals surviving and reproducing more individuals like themselves. Darwin's brilliant insight, the theory of evolution by natural selection, explained the facts well enough that it held on for a long time. But Darwin had never heard of DNA. The selfish gene theory shifted the evolutionary spotlight from the fittest individuals onto the fittest DNA. After all, it's the DNA that carries the information passed from one generation to the next, not whole individuals. Those pieces of DNA that play this game, causing themselves to be replicated by whatever means, are called genes. The fact that evolution seems to revolve around their well-being rather than ours makes them selfish genes. All of biological evolution has been a contest between pieces of DNA to see which genes could make the most copies of themselves. From a gene's point of view, a human being is just a way of making more genes. The trick to understanding genetic evolution, then, is to look at it from the point of view of the pieces of DNA competing for replication. Before we leave the topic of genetic evolution, let's look at one question. What exactly is evolution evolving toward? Most of us who've taken high school biology assume that evolution is guiding us to be fitter and fitter human beings, and steadily improving the quality of life on Earth and in the universe. As time goes by, we complacently assume the fittest of us will survive, reproduce, and create a bigger, better, and stronger human race. Perhaps evolution will favor greater and greater intellect, or even greater and greater contributions to the world. Genetic evolution favors the replication of the fittest DNA. And by fittest, I mean the best at getting replicated. So as long as we're good soldiers for DNA replicators and keep multiplying and expanding, genetic evolution will favor us. But it also favors insects, which vastly outnumber us, and of course, viruses, which parasitically insert themselves into whatever replication mechanism they can find, such as us, and do quite well at it. Whether we're winning, or the insects are, or the viruses are, is simply a matter of frame of reference. It's the DNA that's evolving, and we simply play a part in it. Evolution of genes or memes reflects the haphazard and baroque result of an ongoing struggle, not the product of brilliantly engineered design. What's the difference between evolution and engineering? Engineering is the designing of a whole out of parts suited to their individual purposes. Evolution is the process of tiny incremental changes, each making some small or large improvement in the ability of the thing to survive and reproduce. A good engineer avoids something called a kludge, which is jargon for the use of a part not particularly suited to its purpose. But evolution favors, even cherishes, the kludge, Suddenly finding a new purpose for a part without significantly diminishing its old function is a staple of the evolutionary process. A classic example of an evolutionary kludge is the human eye. The nerves that connect the light-sensing cells to the brain actually come out of the front of the retina rather than the back. The wiring protrudes out into the eye's field of vision. It's difficult to imagine an engineer, let alone God, designing something this way. But evolution took what it had to work with and, kludge by kludge, built an eye. You can imagine a primitive creature having a light-sensing cell that evolved over millions of years into a better and better source of vision. Back when the light-sensing cell was simple, there was no advantage in having it oriented one way or the other. By the time it had developed through kludges into a complex eye with a focusing lens, there was no way to redesign it so the wires would come out the back. It's the kludgy nature of evolution that makes it so difficult to decipher DNA. If DNA worked as a computer program, with its billions of lines of code divided neatly into functions and subroutines, we would have reverse-engineered it by now. Politicians would be vying for votes based on their views on the morality of our producing genetically engineered creatures from scratch. If DNA worked like that, genetic engineers could design, and presumably patent or copyright, any animal or organism they can envision. 
Fortunately or not, the moral debate over such manufactured bio-appliances seems still quite a few years in the future. That's because DNA and evolution don't work like a software engineer writing a computer program. DNA evolves by mutation, by little pieces of it reversing, crossing over, inserting in one place, deleting from another place, resulting in some small or large difference in the development of the embryo and, finally, the full-grown organism. But with minor exceptions, there's no one-to-one -one connection between any particular piece of DNA and a particular piece of the resultant adult organism. The DNA is not a blueprint, contrary to a popular metaphor. There's no place in the human DNA that represents the right index finger or the left little toenail. True, scientists have found a few stretches of human DNA that, to the degree they differ between individuals, seem to map to corresponding changes in the individual's appearance, such as eye color, blood type, or susceptibility to various diseases. But the number of these stretches is minuscule compared to the total amount of human DNA. Scientists seem to be coming to the conclusion that there are huge strings of genetic material in humans that appear to have no effect whatsoever on their host. If we look at DNA as an animal's means of reproducing itself, it makes no sense to have vast stretches of DNA that don't do anything. It's just excess baggage. From the DNA's point of view, however, it makes perfect sense. From the point of view of genetic material, the human being that results from the presence of DNA in male and female sex cells is simply the most effective way nature has found of producing more of the same. The DNA makes use of the safety of the mother's womb to manufacture cell after cell containing copies of itself and finally a new individual ready to go forth and help the DNA multiply yet again. From the DNA's point of view, having copies of itself is our whole point for existing. Keep in mind that species evolved as a result of the fittest, best at replicating, DNA being selected and copied, selected and copied, over and over and over again over millions of years. Other than our intellectual fascination with it, Genetic evolution has little effect on our everyday lives. Worrying about genetic evolution is a little like worrying about being run over by a glacier. Unless you're planning to stand still for the next few thousand years, it's just not going to have much impact. Neither your DNA nor mine will evolve during our lifetimes. It's the end of the DNA era, but it's not the end of the story. For us, it's just the beginning. Humans seem to have reached a higher stage of evolution. What I mean is that our minds, lives, and cultures are affected by the evolution of something besides DNA. Because while genetic evolution happens so slowly that it even takes a leap of faith to believe in it, there's a new kind of evolution happening so fast that it leaves DNA in the Darwinian dust. It's the evolution of something even nearer and dearer to us than DNA. Until a few thousand years ago, DNA was the foremost method in the known universe for storing and replicating information. That's why you can't talk about evolution without talking about DNA. Evolution is about the replication of information, and almost all the information on Earth was stored in DNA. Today we have another medium for storing information, one that replicates, mutates, and propagates far faster than DNA. We have a medium so effective at evolution that new replicators can be created, tried, and spread wildly, all in days or even hours, as compared to thousands of years for DNA. The new medium is so much more interesting and important than DNA to our daily lives that genetic evolution is virtually non-existent by comparison. What is the name of this new, ripe, prolific medium for evolution? It's called the mind, and the replicator that evolves in our minds is called the meme.